Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to lecture 17. Uh, if you recall, in lecture 16, we dealt with issues of knowledge uh, as justified true beliefs. Uh, in this lecture, uh, we intend to discuss uh, this element of truth, which is uh, uh, one of the central problem of philosophy. And um, uh, the topic uh, for today is just truth lost, and I'll just give an introductory perspective. In our next lecture, which is lecture 18, I want to invite you to listen to uh, some of the aspects as we delve into the theories of truth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, philosophical work on truth uh, has been quite abundant uh, during recent decades. And uh, this is um, an introductory lecture uh, on truth, uh, but a lecture that does not really go uh, into the wealth of logical detail uh, that has uh, often characterized a number of treatments in the philosophy of science, and more so dealing with the issue of truth. Now, the topic of truth uh, touches uh, most other subjects uh, within the broad area of philosophical logic, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and also other areas like semantics and epistemology, and of course under the epistemic, uh, uh, under semantics and epistemology, we deal with the nature of the bearers of truth and false, ladies and gentlemen. And of course the other areas are quantification, uh, vagueness, and conditionals. Uh, the other disciplines are model and uh, uh, intuitionist logics, and of course logical paradoxes and uh, the definition of knowledge and justification. So this topic of truth has really uh, moved into many other disciplines and uh, you'll find debates uh, from all over uh, the, the disciplines. Now, in this lecture, I have preferred to focus on the overall map of the battle uh, in the area of philosophy of science, but more so dealing with the uh, uh, true uh, or truth. So the battle around, uh, I'll give you the overall map of the battle uh, around this concept of truth. Uh, and uh, my objective is to indicate the significance of the various theories of the rest of philosophy of economics. Now, this is why the lecture is uh, centrally centered uh, with one of the most discussed uh, topics in the recent philosophical literature, uh, and that is really the deflationist, uh, or what we call the minimalist theories of truth. So the, they are, these theories are very, very attractive, and the debate is very attractive uh, because uh, these theories and the debates are promised to solve or to dissolve some of the main problems of philosophy, ladies and gentlemen, and um, uh, such as the debates between realism and anti-realism, and uh, by making truth a relatively simple thing, and if you recall in lecture 13, 14, 15, that's where we ended, we actually talked about issues of modeling, but uh, the issue of reality came up in that bit. So when we say that the truth is lost, right? Now truth, as I've already said, is a central philosophical notion, perhaps the central one. And many other important philosophical notions depend upon it and uh, uh, they are closely tied to this aspect of truth. So, and um, as you can see, when we talk about uh, truth, there are many things that come up uh, under, for example, thought, uh, and thought is an idea uh, or opinion produced by thinking, an idea or opinion occurring suddenly in the mind. I mean, just like one would say, I have a a thought, right? Or comrade has a sudden thought, or Bad Bernard has a, a, a certain thought, right? Or a sudden thought in this case. So thought in this case is a kind of inward dialogue uh, carried on uh, in the mind itself, as uh, given by Thetis uh, in around uh, 189 E and 190, and that judgment results uh, when the two inward voices in this case affirm the same thing. Uh, so when we start talking about thought, then there is that uh, inward uh, judgment 
uh, and uh, uh, that comes in. Now, the other aspect is belief. So whenever we talk about uh, truth, then belief also comes in. Now, when we say uh, that I believe something or we believe something, to believe something is to believe that it is true. And uh, this is an acceptance that something exists or is true, especially one without proof. So when you say uh, Bernard uh, believes the, in the extraterrestrial life, uh, it actually means that is his belief in this case. So belief is an important aspect that comes to the fore whenever we start discussing knowledge uh, or discussing truth in this perspective. So the other aspect is knowledge, which you have already discussed in lecture uh, 16. Now, if one knows a proposition, then it is true, right? And the other thing that comes in is reality. Reality is what our true statements or beliefs and theories are about. And the other issue is about fact. And the facts are what makes our statements true, ladies and gentlemen. So the other one, um, well, you have issues of possibility and necessity. I'm not really going into details of these. Uh, can one say something true about what is merely possible? Are there propositions which can be true in all possible words? Right, plus so many other things, right. Uh, but the issue of existence is also important because uh, philosophers have been really uh, discussing over the years the issues of metaphysics. And uh, if you see there is um, uh, a link between metaphysics, uh, then ontology and epistemology, and so forth. But uh, certainly these are very important in this case. So the issue of existence or being, can we talk truly about non-existence in this case? So just to uh, demonstrate a few things, um, uh, you'll, you'll discover that when we talk about existence and being, there is a debate that, uh, uh, that uh, has been put forward uh, and led by Martin Hedger, uh, 1949. And um, in philosophy, uh, according to Martin, uh, uh, being means the material, right? We are talking about being, B-E-I-N-G, being. Yeah? It means the material or the immaterial existence of a particular thing. So you can't say that I see, right, this bottle here. So you can talk about a being, but you can also see me here and you can talk about a human being, right? So we are talking about the issue of being and in philosophy, being is an important aspect. And this is a, an issue that has been discussed in metaphysics, right? And there are so many perspectives that uh, go into this. So whenever we talk about being, we actually say that something exists. So anything that exists, ladies and gentlemen, is being. Now ontology in this case is a branch of philosophy that studies being. Don't forget that. Being is a concept uh, encompassing the objective and subjective features of reality and existence. And uh, anything that uh, partakes in a being is also called a being, right? Don't forget that. We talked about the objective and the subjective features of reality and existence, right? Because we are talking about existence and being uh, as uh, propounded by uh, Hedger. But anything that partakes in being is also called a being. Uh, though often uh, this usage is limited to uh, entities that have subjectivity, as in the expression of a human being. When you see me, you can say, well, that's a human being. Now, uh, but do not forget that uh, really in ontology we are dealing with the being, the nature of being. So you can even talk about this. So what constitutes uh, this uh, aspect that we are discussing? So. Uh, as you can see, the notion of being has um, inevitably uh, been elusive and controversial in the history of philosophy and uh, beginning in Western philosophy uh, with attempts among the pre-Socratics uh, to deploy it intelligibly. And uh, the first effort to recognize and define the concept came from para, pa, uh, Parmenides, uh, who famously said uh, of it, that what is, is. So Parmenides uh, said that, that when you talk about being, you are referring to what is, 
is, right? What is, is, right? That is the existence, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see. So common words such as is, right, are, uh, am, refer directly or indirectly to being. Right? He is, right? So that means that's a being, right? So you're talking about existence, right? You're talking about material existence, or probably immaterial existence. Is, right? John is, right? Uh, they are and am, right? That's where we are. Uh, so refer directly or indirectly to being. Now, in his first uh, div uh, division, ladies and gentlemen, being, being, this element of being is prima facie of two kinds. Uh, the one that you can call substance and the other is accident. So when you talk about substance, right, you are talking about something that you can see, substance. But there's other things which are accidental, and these are embedded within other things, as you can see. So we, we, when we say that accident, when we say being in, is a prima facie, right, Accident, right? Accident is that whose being subsists in something else. Uh, so that being which is complete without it is uh, either active by itself or due to something else. And uh, I can give you an example. An example of this condition is the whiteness of a cloth, right? So when you say this cloth is white, this cloth is red, this cloth is blue, right? We note that the cloth exists, right? And that's a material being, and you're talking about substance in this case. So the cloth exists either by itself or due to itself, or by means of whose things which bring about its being in this case. But look at the element of whiteness. Whiteness subsists in a dependent manner in it. So whiteness and whatever is analogous to it are called accidents in this case. So in this context, ladies and gentlemen, the receptacle of whiteness is called a subject, although in another context something else is meant by subject. Thus, a subject is that which he is, not an accident, whose being, moreover, is not a subject in a, in a subject but uh, is a reality such that the being of that reality, ladies and gentlemen, that essence are not receptible to another thing having the aforesaid char uh, characteristics. So one may regard uh, the substance as um, uh, a receptible uh, which lacks this character in this case. But uh, to be active, this substance needs to be accepted by this receptible uh, that we have already seen in this case, whose reality we then establish later when we clarify its nature. So one may regard the substance neither as a receptacle nor as being in a receptacle, as we shall also establish subsequently when we explain its being, ladies and gentlemen. So this then is called a substance, ladies and gentlemen. So Aristotle's position Right, now we go back to the early philosophers, Aristotle. Aristotle's position became very clear in subsequent sections of the metaphysics when he indicates that uh, mathematics cut off a part of being. So whereas metaphysics investigates being as being, ignoring those elements of being which are related to it uh, in an accidental manner are a determination of being. For example, account of this topic, right? If you want to understand what we are talking about uh, in this subject or in this lecture, then you must see Owens, the doctrine of being in the Aristotelian metaphysics. And of course, uh, this is uh, published 1953 in Toronto. So it is also central, as you can see, because we need to understand what theoretical life is about. 
uh, and what it aims at. Now, science is said to be a search for truth, a search for knowledge, and that's why we define knowledge as justified true belief. This is also, a, 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 sorry, this is very important and also applies to economics and uh, philosophy as a discipline and other disciplines, ladies and gentlemen. So, practical life, by contrast, is said to be uh, the search for the good or the search for the just. And it does not result in things that are true or false, but many philosophers claim that the good or the just are objects of knowledge. And uh, uh, in, so, in, 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 in so far as knowledge involves truth, this notion is relevant in the practical realm as well. So knowledge as we have seen and knowledge as we know it is justified through beliefs. So even if ethics is not to be understood as a matter of knowledge uh, 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 of certain truth, uh, but say as a matter of expression and regulation of feelings, it's important for us to understand that nature of truth in order to see the contrast, ladies and gentlemen. So even when you start discussing issues of ethics, right, you must at least have a certain element of truth in it, and of course the contrast of that. Otherwise, you'll not be able to discuss issues of truth very well. And this applies to aesthetics too. Uh, and of course, we know aesthetics is judging that uh, something is beautiful. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but for you to be able to judge that something is very beautiful, uh, you must really know certain truth about what constitutes beauty. Otherwise, you will not be able to tell. And if not, then we'll have, uh, you won't be able to tell the difference between aesthetics and, uh, of course, truth-seeking discourse in this case. So it is similar for evaluating the difference between uh, metaphorical and literal discourse, uh, poetry and uh, prose, rhetoric and science, uh, fiction and non-fiction, uh, historiography and the narratives and so forth. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, in this case, we have a major philosophical task, right? A major, major, major philosophical task in this case to understand what role truth plays in our ordinary as well as uh, in our more so uh, uh, conceptions or conceptual models. So we need to understand what truth is and what role truth plays in our ordinary as well as in our more sophisticated conceptual schemas or schemes, right? And uh, uh, then when we uh, do this, we shall be able to understand what knowledge is all about because knowledge is about uh, justify true beliefs. Let me just give you a simple example uh, for us to illustrate this element of knowledge. Remember, uh, we are discussing truth, and, in, and, and, and the truth is an element of knowledge because knowledge is justified true beliefs. Now, since we are dealing with the truth lost, we need to understand uh, truth very well. And um, let me just give you a simple example that is taken from the Bible. Uh, for example, uh, in the Bible, uh, in John, uh, in the book of John, chapter 18, verse 38, uh, we see Pilate uh, is jesting, right? Pilate is known for having jested. Uh, what is truth? And he seems to have many disciples today, right? There are many people who believe in Pilate, right? Pontius Pilate. So, just to read for you, uh, again, the, what is contained in that uh, uh, scripture, John 18, uh, verse 38, but for us to understand the context very well, we shall start from verse that, uh, 33, right? So, John 18, verse 33, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, says that uh, then Pilate entered the, uh, the, the, the governor's headquarters, what they call the Praetorium again. So then Pilate entered the Praetorium again. Uh, he called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus, Jesus answered and said, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did the others tell you this concerning me? Then in verse 35, 
Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And in verse 36, Jesus answered. This is a conversation between Pilate and Jesus. Jesus answered and said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, say to Jesus, are you a king then? Jesus answered and said, you say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Now, Jesus is talking about the truth. I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate in verse 38 jests. Pilate says to him, what is the truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. I find no fault in him at all. In verse 37, Pilate therefore said, said to him, are you a king? Right? I hope you still remember that verse 37. Jesus answered, you say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now, what Jesus in this case meant was that he was born. He came into this world, right, to witness, to bear witness to the truth. And therefore, if you are of the truth, you will then hear his voice. Right, and remember, that's the time when Jesus was around and Pilate was also around and the Jews were also around and oh well, the account unfolds. So Jesus meant in verse 37, because you don't hear right, you don't respect and believe my voice, you are not of the truth. And uh, he meant that. So in others, remember, we are talking about knowledge, justified true beliefs, right? Propositional knowledge was advanced. Actually, the propositions were advanced in this case. Right, so for these propositions, there are about three things that are pertinent. One was um, justification, right? In other words, you must have evidence. That evidence must be true and it must be justifiable. And Jesus is telling Pilate that all those three things had taken place, but Pilate was not seeing. And that's why he says, right, that for this reason, or for this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. But those who are not of the truth, they don't actually hear, and they don't even respect. So phrases such as the disinterested search for truth arouse mockery, ladies and gentlemen. So even scientists are cautious about saying that they produce true theories of the world. They prefer to talk about models, right? Because they don't have true theories. When we model a particular reality out there, that's just a small part of the entire universe. And there are so many interactions and many things taking place. Reality is complex. So
So it's only religious leaders, ladies and gentlemen, who are not afraid of such talk. Philosophers themselves, at least from uh, Nisi, all words have made us wary of it. Truth has a smell of scientism. Truth, right, has a smell of positivism. Truth, right, uh, tells us that we must have uh, justification, right, and we must believe uh, in those statements and propositions that we make. So for a number of contemporary thinkers, truth is sort of relic of a bygone age, as Russell in 1912 famously said about the notion of cause in today's physics, ladies and gentlemen. So that is very important. And if you read the work of the Foucault uh, philosophy, and I want to invite you during your free time to read. By the way, I want to come to a close. Uh, possibly this is a, a lecture that uh, we shall continue discussing in uh, our lecture. So these are aspects we shall continue discussing in lecture 18 when we go into the theories of truth. But remember, I'm just giving you an introduction to the truth that we think uh, is lost. So you can see in this case, there are so many schools of thoughts, right? And I want to go into those schools, but I've already said that uh, uh, in this case, it's only religious people who do not fear talking about the truth, right? But others, when they are talking about the truth about the world, they are very, very cautious. Because what you call truth may not actually be truth in that case, and can be questioned. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly religious people can say anything that they want to say. And now, that doesn't mean that whatever they are saying is correct. And uh, that's why we need also to interrogate. Uh, and one that Jesus also made the same statement um, in the Bible. Uh, when he said that such uh, uh, the, the, the truth because in them uh, you think you have uh, eternal life or you have knowledge, right? So it's very important to continue searching these things as you can see here. So uh, truth must be guided by science, right? So the, that's one of the most dominant trends in the field. Uh, of truth or in the field of philosophy, uh, which is followed by scientific and rigorous studies. Uh, and you can actually call that laboratory life uh, at the end of the day. So uh, if you are not guided by truth and you are not guided by ideals of objectivity, then of course most of the things that you'll be saying will not be correct, ladies and gentlemen. So that's what it is. Now, in this a lecture, as I close, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is suggested, uh, of course, depending on the school where you belong, school of philosophy, there are those who think that we have the truth and we can know the truth, and there are those who are on the extreme, they think that you can't know. So it is suggested that uh, there is no such thing as truth. There are those scholars who believe that, some philosophers who believe that. Uh, and uh, there are those who also believe that there are so many truths, there are many truths, uh, and of course, uh, most of the researchers, uh, if you are uh, very uh, conversant with the research process, uh, usually people use their own lenses. Uh, that's why you have uh, a mathematician using a, math a mathematical lens to examine a particular situation. A lawyer will use a legal lens. A psychologist will use a psychological lens. And of course, um, uh, accountants will use uh, the accounting lens. So we use so many lenses. So in such cases, if somebody looks at an issue using his own lens or perspective, right, uh, and uh, a theologian doing the same thing, then you can talk about many truths in this case, uh, because each person will see and uh, will adduce evidence uh, that supports his or her view in that case. So you can talk about justified true beliefs because knowledge exists in all those disciplines. So truth for X or truth for Y or truth in this context and truth in that context uh, then becomes pertinent, ladies and gentlemen. So that's why you have the relativism, you have the nihilism about truth, and uh, these are certainly alternatives uh, to the truth. So truth 
in such views, right, is merely an effect, a projection of our discourses into a fictional reality in itself, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, whatever the case, ladies and gentlemen, the issue of truth becomes important and we have to continue searching the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Right, so as we come close to the end, right, uh, let me just say this. Uh, a number of contemporary philosophers uh, have attempted to resist uh, uh, a number of perspectives and conceptions of truth. And uh, uh, many of them are faithful to the traditional view according to which there are at least some uh, regions of discourse, uh, in particular in science, which are truth apt, that is susceptible to be assessed for truth or false. So anything that is outside may not be taken on. So they agree that um, uh, they claim that we can uh, describe or mirror an independent reality is not easy to defend without all sorts of qualifications. And that's why you have all those lenses that I've just, uh, that I've just given you. But they still agree uh, that truth is at least a regulative ideal and that philosophy can be regarded as a theoretical attitude which can produce arguments and evaluate them as well as it can promote certain claims uh, which can be confronted with the facts, uh, however difficult it is uh, to spell out those particular uh, facts. We also know that analytic philosophy uh, in the 20th century, uh, from its realist beginning uh, with the works of Fridge, I'm sure you have read the works of Fridge and Russell and Moore, and its attempts during the logical positivist period uh, to demarcate uh, sciences from metaphysics to its contemporary attraction for naturalism and scientific realism illustrates the permanent appeal of talk in terms of truth and associated notions uh, such as correspondence or verification. And these are things that we are going to discuss in our subsequent lectures when we start going into the theories of truth and discussing the correspondence truth, ladies and gentlemen. So a major and striking difference between uh, the traditional, uh, or, or, or probably the tradition in philosophy and the tradition known as continental philosophy is that analytic philosophers have devoted a lot of effort trying to account for the meaning of the simple word true and uh, to discuss the various possible theories of truth. So they want to know what it means to say that our theories of the world are true and whether they can actually say it uh, to uh, be so. So can we say that our theories about the world are correct and uh, uh, do we have evidence uh, to prove that the theories that we hold about the world are true? So that's why our attempt in modeling, our attempt to do research is try and study and understand reality, but we want to come to that element of truth. We want to come up with knowledge, and that's why knowledge is justified uh, through beliefs, ladies and gentlemen. So as I close, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you uh, for attending this lecture. And uh, our objective in this lecture was to actually uh, look at truth uh, lost, uh, but more so examining truth as one of the major and central issues of philosophy. Uh, and uh, I've given you in a brief sketch uh, those aspects that constitute truth. Now, what I'm going to do uh, in our lecture 18 is to take you uh, through classical theories of truth. But I will start with a preliminary map. I want to thank you for attending this lecture. I want to thank you for being patient. And I can only say stay well, uh, stay safe. Bye.